I am Mike Howell. I kicked off this early this morning with Dan Chanock, and uh, we're really pleased that we've got the uh, august panel of speakers from OMB here this afternoon. Uh, unfortunately, one of our speakers was unable to make it. Dustin Brown is not here, but Norman Dong, the deputy controller, Leslie Field, the deputy administrator for federal procurement policy, and Lisa Schlosser, the deputy associate administrator for e-government, are all here. And as we talked about this morning, uh, and throughout the day, the criticality of the financial function, the acquisition function, the IT function, and in Dustin's case, HR and performance to enabling the success of shared services initiatives is really important. And we want to hear more about that from our OMB speakers. Uh, customers, as we've heard during the day, expect a well-integrated, well-orchestrated, well-oiled machine when it comes to their engagement, the one-stop shopping, the coherent support activity. The program managers don't want to have to pick and choose and deal with the gaps between these supporting functions. They want to see this as an integrated function, and the case studies definitely support that when that's done well, it can contribute to the success of shared service initiatives. So what I'd like to lead off with is um, a question that's come up during the day for each of the panelists is just what is OMB's position and perspective on shared services and any direction for this audience for the way forward in the future? We can just start with you, Leslie. Yeah. Um, so when we think about uh, shared services and reducing duplication, I think in the acquisition world, we think a lot about strategic sourcing, and I'm sure that's probably not news, um, but when you think about how much we buy every year, the ability to leverage that spend is, inc is incredibly important. And I think we, we've made some good progress. I think we have a, a ways to go. And so back in December, um, OMB issued a memorandum that stood up the Strategic Sourcing Leadership Council, which was to bring the, the top seven spending agencies together to help us figure out, gosh, where can we save money? Where can we leverage our buy? Where can we reduce duplication? And then learn about our commodities so that we buy less, we consume less and really take that commodity management approach. So when we think about shared services and sharing assets and, and sharing information for the acquisition folks, that's really, that's really um, our focus. And I know Joe Jordan, our administrator, um, has that as his top priority. In terms of OMB's position, I think it kind of varies. I think generally there's much more of an emphasis on shared services across the board. Uh, within each line of business within OMB, you might have slightly different approaches in terms of the level of detail. Uh, and the level of prescriptiveness to date. Uh, within the financial management line of business, I think we've taken a very strong stance on the question of shared services. If you look back at M1308, which we released earlier this year, uh, very clear mandate for agencies to take a shared services approach as they identify the need to modernize their financial management systems. Um, and I want to underscore this point. This is not a you know, fire the start gun, mad rush to shared services. Everybody's got to get there within two years. Okay, go. But it is much more of a thoughtful migration over time. And we think that will help uh, increase the uptake in shared services across the federal government over time. And um, we recognize that this is not our first time looking at the question of shared services. And Dropped your mic. Yeah, no, I was trying to be quiet about it so <laughs> nobody would notice, but thanks, Norm, for, didn't for pointing that out. I really, really appreciate that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. You can tell we all work very collaboratively here in this group, so. A little bit of levity just yes. to get us started for the day. Um, we recognize that there are some lessons learned from our past experience on shared services, both in terms of, uh, you've heard me say this before, on the supply side, looking at the federal shared service providers and recognizing that uh, they are well accustomed to servicing the smaller agencies, but probably not as tested or experienced in terms of dealing with the larger agencies. So as we are uh, facilitating conversations between large agencies and shared services, shared service providers in the federal space, we're seeing where there's some gaps. So I know for one agency, one large agency, as they've been talking to a shared service provider, they recognize that data warehousing is one element that is not as robust as it needs to be with that provider. And it's been helpful because it's helping us identify that we need to kind of probably make more investments uh, 
across the federal shared service providers as they, you know, if we expect them to truly service uh, the larger market and meet the demands of larger agencies. And then on the supply side, I'm sorry, on the demand side, as we look at, you know, what large agencies are asking for, I think we recognize that in the past, when we looked at this question, we probably gave a little too much latitude and a little too much flexibility to the large agencies in terms of allowing them to adhere to their legacy requirements and their legacy business processes. And we recognize that if this model is to work and if we truly are going to achieve economies of scale, then we need to be a little bit more disciplined in terms of what large agencies uh, can ask for and to have them bend to the business processes and requirements of the shared service providers as opposed to the other way around. So lessons learned from our past experience, and again, I wanna underscore the point that you know, we are doing this over time, and it is not something where it's gonna be a mad rush because I think we create much more risk uh, and non unnecessary expense if we try to get everybody to a shared service provider immediately. So this is something that we see happening over five, 10, 15 years, but we expect that we'll have a far better result if we take the time to do it right. And I'd probably, I'd probably say as an overriding position, it's, it's probably best to um, probably, probably turn to uh, the shared, shared first, shared services guidance that was put out by OMB in 2012. I think it was uh, in May 2012 specifically where you know, what we're really encouraging overall is uh, a shared first mentality uh, across the federal government, across the agencies, and hopefully with our vendor community too. Um, it's, it's looking, when you have a need, when you have a requirement, uh, looking across your agency, looking across the federal government, and determining where there might be an opportunity to share first before you build from scratch. So uh, I'd say as an, as an overall position, that's a really good place to, to kind of start and, and look in terms of you know, what, what OMB, OMB is trying to drive across the government. Um, and then also kind of look at not just that, that policy, uh, but also things like strategic sourcing. Uh, so that when you want to make that big desktop buy, when you want to make that big mobile buy, where is there a strategic sourcing opportunity? Where is there a government-wide contract available where you can capitalize uh, on economies of scale for better pricing, for more consistent services? So, uh, so again, it's, it's, I'd say that, that position overall is share first. Consider share and share shared services first. Okay. Uh, so we've had a lot of discussion today about both the opportunity side, the value and benefit side of shared services but a significant number of concerns about sort of the barriers and challenges and obstacles. So question for your, uh, the three of you is, what do you think the key challenges are for them, for shared services to be successful in the government? And how would you recommend dealing with those challenges? So I think for strategic sourcing, and I would imagine this applies to, um, to the other areas too, is a lot of agencies still have the culture of let's build it here at home because we know exactly what we need. We have people in place. Um, we're going to be held accountable for the deadline, so we want to be in control of that acquisition or of that effort. And so I think there's, we need to get to a place where agencies feel comfortable with other agencies providing those services or that contract or, or that work. And so to that extent, and I know we've talked about it before, but how do you measure whether that particular contract or that agency is doing a good job? Are they getting the right price? Do they know exactly what that transaction costs? Do they know how much it's going to cost if you buy 100 of these things? Um, do you know what kind of performance they're offering? Is this within the range of, of normal commercial practices? So I think there's a little bit of data around you know, making uh, sure people understand what the performance expectations are as a provider so that as somebody who's looking for those kinds of services, you feel comfortable giving your agency work to them. And I think we, we struggle with that a little bit um, within the Strategic Sourcing Leadership Council um, because we're not really always sure that the providers are giving or getting the best deals a lot of agencies think that they can get better deals on their own. In some cases, that, that may be true. We need to figure out why. And so we've put in place a very structured process, a key decision point process for these vehicles so that we can walk through that so that by the time you get to that vehicle or that solution, the agencies feel comfortable that they can, they can give their, their program and their spend to another agency. So I think, I think those are probably the two biggest challenges in the way we've uh, chosen to overcome it. Thanks. I want to just build off of what Leslie was saying and just kind of put my own experience, or draw upon my own experience on this, on the question of loss of control. 
And I remember when I was working at FEMA and we were looking at the possibility of going to a federal shared service provider, we were really nervous because we had things like housing assistance payments that had to go out very quickly after a disaster struck. And we were just grappling with the question of, all right, will they be able to do this within two days? And what happens if they don't? And so I want to kind of build off of the discussion on you know, SLAs and clear performance metrics. And the real question that I think we need to run to ground is not just what are the metrics, but what do you do? What's your recourse if the provider doesn't perform? Are you stuck there? I mean, it's not like you can hit them with heavy penalties. You've got you know, other types of risk where you've got a very low tolerance for failure. So what is your recourse if for some reason that provider doesn't perform? And I don't think that we truly have thought that question all the way through. Um, so I, I would probably say a couple things. Um, one is, uh, and, and Norm and Leslie covered the kind of the culture and, and repercussions of, of, uh, of a shared service and, and not meeting expectations. I'd, I'd probably also uh, tie in as another challenge, um, you know, process. So it, everything kind of comes down to in management and how you run a better, more effective organization, right? Looking at your people, looking at your processes, looking at how you're using technology effectively. So. I'd probably look at challenges in those areas as well. We talked about people, so people, culture, like giving up control, always, always kind of one of the, one of the barriers. Um, Second is process, um, and and what I mean by that is is how do we how do we set up uh, systems and processes to more effectively, quickly, and efficiently be able to set up a shared service, um, you know, uh, set up a mechanism to. Uh, transfer funding across the federal government to uh, procure a shared service, whether it's with a public partner or a private partner. Um, and you know, how do we sign those inter? How do we make those interagency agreements be quicker and more standardized? So, so those are some of the the challenges that we've seen. And and where I've seen those 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 barriers be overcome is in situations where you can have a forum like we have here. So it's, it's where you bring in from the very beginning when you're thinking about this idea of shared first, when you want to move to a shared service, bringing in your CXO team, getting senior leadership support for that shared service, getting your senior um, CXO team together to get support and understand the dynamics of how you put in place an interagency agreement, how you transfer the funding. Uh, what kind of technology do you need? What kind of interfaces do you need? So, so bringing that team together, and another key part of that team is your general counsel. So getting your general counsel as part of that CXO team at the table with you from the very beginning when you're considering a shared service is another way of kind of offsetting or mitigating the, the risks of moving to a shared service and breaking down that barrier. So that, that's probably the one I would like to touch, I wanted to touch on as well. Can we do another round on this question? Absolutely. Nope. I like it. One chance. That's it. No, you're done. I, I wanted That's to it. have some more conversation around the issue of governance, uh, particularly as it relates to shared service providers that may be nested in a larger program agency, because I know that there's been some conversation uh, and some issues raised around that. So, you know, one set of questions is, all right, uh, what is the voice of the customers that are being uh, served by a shared service provider that may be nested in a Department of Interior or a Department of Transportation, and how do those voices get balanced? Is it always the priority? Are the priorities always coming from the host agency? Because that's, that was the original customer, and how do you balance that against some other larger agencies that you take on? So I think we're still trying to work through that issue. Also, the question is, you know, if you've got a bunch of itty bitty agencies that have been served by the provider and then all of a sudden a big agency comes in, how do you kind of balance that in terms of who gets more weight, whose voice gets more weight in the process? So again, some very practical issues that we're working through right now. So I'll see you one and I'll raise you one. Um, <laughs> the questions around service providers that have come up during the day would be sort of in the generic category of how can OMB help? How can OMB help make uh, the incentives more attractive for the service providers when the provider is inside and beholden to the home agency first and foremost and the home agency money first and foremost. Um, 
how can Owen be helped when the policies and procedures currently in place, that's one thing that Lisa and I are aware of, made it take a year for the following to happen. One year, major interagency effort. This is exactly what took one year to happen. <laughs> you got a dollar? Just that. <laughs> Moving a dollar from one agency to the pro from the customer to the provider <laughs> took a year. How can OMB help on some of these mechanical and structural and governance issues to overcome those barriers? Sorry, I was getting stuck on the OMB helping piece of it. So I'm just gonna I'll have to. Fix I'm stuck on how Leslie got a dollar out of this. Oh, she gave it back. Okay, good. All right, got it. Um, so, so how can OMB help? And that, that's sort of the perennial question, I think, just generally speaking. But, um, but in terms of the service providers, I think as Norm and Lisa have mentioned, we need to be incredibly clear about what we expect from the provider, what we expect from the, from the agencies that are buying the services, and what those performance metrics are. I think we have to go back to the math associated with whether this is a good deal, how do we know it's a good deal, how do we know somebody's doing a good job, um, and, and figuring out sort of the, sort of taking it to a, a more neutral place so that we, we can make sure that this, the providers are, are doing what we ask them to do. And so OMB is good at policy, in case nobody noticed, we do a lot of that. Um, policy, we're good at implementation, but we're also good at convening the right people together. So for example, the SSLC helps us to think about the governance questions related to strategic sourcing. We've got the Chief Acquisition Officers Council, as do my colleagues, they've got councils and their affinity groups. And so how can we leverage those groups? You've got some great people, some very smart people, people with lots of experience. How can we leverage those folks to help us think through some of those tricky questions? Uh, let me just pick up on Leslie's point about OMB's good at policy. Uh, yeah, we probably are pretty good at policy in terms of dictating what the agency should do. Probably less uh, suited to deal with questions of implementation. So at least within the financial management line of business, we're leaning very heavily on Treasury and the Office of Financial Innovation and Transformation, FIT, and I think you'll be hearing from Adam a little bit later today. Um, but they very much are our implement arm on the question of shared services in the financial management space and you know I see Treasury doing three things that speak to this issue one is you know helping determine the set of providers by establishing criteria and then applying that criteria in terms of who should be a provider versus who should be a customer and we want to make sure and as we ask that question one of the questions we want to ask is you know to make sure that we've got, you know, criteria that would prevent providers from favoring their own agency at the expense of external customers, to truly embrace the, the concept and the intent of shared service providers so that you don't have this kind of uh, system of ha unequal treatment that may have, we may have seen in the past but we don't want to see in the future. Uh, Similarly, Treasury is helping us think through questions of governance, not just in terms of governance for specific shared service providers, but also kind of at the larger government-wide space. And then finally, on the question of benchmarking, Treasury has been doing a lot of work. We talk about how we want to move agencies to federal shared service providers, but where we're having less, we're, we're assuming that it'll be better in terms of quality, cost, and performance, but let's make sure that it's better in terms of quality, cost, and performance, and let's kind of hold ourselves all accountable in terms of having clear visibility on how the federal shared service providers are performing and be able to compare that back to how agencies are performing. So I, I think you need to have that clear transparency on performance and cost at the end of the day, if this model's to work. So to pull on that just a little, um, historically, we've heard things from our performance management programs and our financial management programs. Well, the financial management system and the performance management system, financial management in particular, is not structured in a way that we can get the granularity of either current costs for what we're paying out of our budgets for this thing to get a fully loaded cost model versus future options. I'm curious, in the financial management modernization, will we have that transparent capability built into the system? I think it's too easy to blame the system for why we don't have cost and performance information. You know, when people say it's a systems issue, I say, okay, what's your workaround? And it 
you know, at FEMA, we were able to get information on cost and performance. And if we could do it at FEMA, I think we could probably do it at a couple other agencies as well. So I think, you know, the whole systems excuse is a little bit of a smoke screen. And I think we just need to, you know, be a little bit more disciplined in terms of holding our collective feet to the fire in terms of producing cost and performance information. And Treasury's done some great work working with the federal shared service providers to get that information. And they've created a platform that will allow us greater visibility in terms of how agencies are performing and what it costs to do this work. Okay. Okay. Do you want another bite at this apple? No, I, I think Norm, uh, Norm answered that very, very well, as okay. did Leslie. So. <laughs> Um, we have a combination in the audience of both public sector and private sector people involved in these kinds of programs if, in support of the federal government. And there's a range of options from fully public to fully private to public-private partnerships. Um, do you have a perspective on which, if any, or what range of those choices uh, OMB's perspective would be, should be fair game and consideration for the future? What are our choices again? <laughs> I, I, I'll probably I'll start with that one since you guys have tackled the other ones and and probably I'd like to turn around and ask some ask this audience a couple questions on that but uh, let me start with um, you know I, I think rather than than pinpoint whether we prefer this or that it's it's more you know who's providing uh, the best customer service who's providing the most efficient cost efficient you know operation and service uh, to uh, the federal government and on behalf of the, the federal uh, or the, uh, the citizen taxpayer. I mean, so I'd, I'd turn it back on who are the, who, I'd turn it back on customer service and really think about customer service and, and probably what I'd love to hear about now or Mike, whenever you'd like to, to have the audience, mm -hmm. you know, kind of kind of chime in is, is where, where have you seen a shared service in the federal government, either a line of business uh, or within an agency uh, that you've said, wow, that, that's an outstanding shared service. Um, that is what all shared services should be in the federal government. I mean, that's that's something I'd like to think about and I'd like to hear about. And where there is a shared service like that, wh what's making that shared service so effective or what's making the customer service ar around that shared service, uh, you know, um, something that, that we want to emulate or that we want to, to highlight uh, as a positive. So. Um, I, I would love to hear from anybody here where you had a, a good experience. We always hear about the bad experiences. We always hear about the, you know, why, why is, is this, this particular organization or entity a, a shared service versus this when uh, I can't get my requirements met. I, I'd like to hear where there's, there's good models out there. And that can be private uh, or public or private examples. So I'd, I'd love to hear that and then talk through from there. Great. <laughs> Actually, this was because um, I did a bit of a analysis, a best practice paper, on behalf of ACT IAC about six years ago, and e rulemaking probably was one of the biggest successes we could point to. It had a number of real interesting elements behind it. The first of which OMB dictated it, um, <laughs> and I think there were only two agencies that were allowed to uh, allow themselves out of the e-rulemaking uh, parameters. And also they had an incredibly active organization that included all of their stakeholders. So every user of e-rulemaking was invited to participate in their uh, selecting priorities over the coming year. So that was my observation. And so if I had to answer that question before we go to the next person, uh, that happens to be one I know a lot about. So, um, so I, let me let me add something to that. If I if I break down that shared service and answer the question that that kind of I posed of of what is a good shared service, where is there a pretty high degree of, of customer satisfaction with the service? And I I looked at e-rulemaking, which I happen to agree. Actually, I think it's and that's not just because I ran it for several years. Uh, it's really because again and again uh, you do hear that as a good model. It's it's one of the one of the uh, original e-government uh, initiatives uh, that, that has been sustained over time and, and you have a pretty robust uh, governance. Uh, so, so, so what makes that successful, if I had to break it down, welcome to, to hear anything else. One, you, you hit upon most of them, but one, uh, it's actually in legislation that this shared service will exist, right? It's in the e-government act of 2000, I should know that off the top of my head. Two, 2002, thanks, Dan. Uh, so, so one, it's, it's legislatively, statutorily required. 
Uh, two, uh, OMB uh, supports it, right? So OMB plays an, an active role in ensuring agencies work with the e-rulemaking team, uh, that there's governance, that there's structure around what we do there, and there's enforcement of participation in that shared service. Uh, uh, number three, um, there's, there's been agency leadership. So the managing partner uh, of, of e-rulemaking has been EPA. Uh, you had Kim Nelson, uh, you had Linda Travers, um, you had, um, you, and you have others in EPA that have been true leaders um, on this initiative. They've tried hard to, to get the community's input uh, into what they're doing, how they're doing it. Um, they've communicated, I think, pretty well and pretty transparently about what they're doing it and when they're, when they're gonna add new features, new functions, they listen. Um, and I'd say the other thing is there's a really good governance process uh, with that, that shared service that's inclusive, uh, that um, they meet regularly. They, again, listen to the both internal community and the external community. Uh, they come up with plans, they run those plans, they stay within budget and on time with the delivery of new functionality and continuously communicate what they're doing. Uh, so, so if I look at a shared service and I look at a successful one, those are kind of the factors across the board that make it a successful shared service. So I, I just thought I'd add that in. I think, there, I think Scott has a question or Scott, you're next. I'm Scott Quayle, uh, Senior Principal at Accenture, uh, uh, retired uh, Chief Financial Officer and Assistant Secretary for Administration at the Department of Commerce. Uh, and I think an example of a shared service that worked, has worked quite well was uh, uh, Treasury is HR Connect. Uh, in response to it, there was a consensus within the Department of Commerce and its many component bureaus that our 24 disconnected, disaggregated CUF HR systems couldn't, still couldn't quite tell us exactly how many people we had funded or unfunded without a data call. That wasn't where we wanted to be. We had a consensus that we wanted to go to a terrific single shared system. We uh, uh, collectively looked at our working capital fund, found some, uh, found, made tough choices in terms of what we weren't going to continue funding to, to capitalize transition costs, and looked at alternatives analysis of shared service providers that could meet our requirements with a with a kind of a blood packed up front that we were not going to be customizing that once we picked a path that was the path and uh, in looking at the alternatives analysis the needle landed on Treasury HR connect uh, we we found OMB to be a very ready and able partner uh, with respect to supporting analysis waivers when necessary and frankly, not sweeping the money that we had identified, but to understand that this was an investment, and through good faith, we were looking at you know, capitalizing modernization in a shared service way through internal efficiencies. We had budget, we had uh, CIO, we had acquisition, uh, all, and the HR folks all working together. Um, my, understa my understanding is that implementation has been, is, it's a three-year implementation, uh, we, uh, uh, across the, uh, all the bureaus. My, uh, now I believe completing the second year of implementation, my understanding is it's going smoothly. We have every time uh, OPM is serving an advisory role, Treasury is, is there. There's absolute urgency on behalf of the provider to, to, in terms of status briefings, in terms of rigorous program management. And I, my understanding is that implementation is on time and on budget. If, any, if anybody knows differently, please let me know. I feel sad. But the, um, <laughs> I think it's an it's example that we may want to pay more attention to. Great, great examples. Okay, so uh, building from that, one of the questions we, we had is there's an awful lot of these. If you look at the uh, communities, the ecosystems involved, you've got multiple federal agencies and their bureaus and their programs and their regions. You've got non-federal constituencies and stakeholders in some cases, you've got private sector providers. In all of this complexity, um, how can you help the people, the best practice stories, find each other to be discoverable and reusable instead of having to go out and reinvent the wheel from scratch? Well, uh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go I've ahead. been talking a lot. You go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I think it starts by having centralization within the agencies. So for example, at one point in time in the agency where I used to work, the payment 
function was actually decentralized across all of 10 regions compared to headquarters. So we had to undergo some centralization there to be able to kind of clarify you know, who's responsible for the function as opposed to having it distributed. But once you've done that, I think it comes back to setting up uh, the infrastructure within government to make these, uh, to facil facilitate the transactions and to you know, broker the deals. And again, I come back to uh, the work that FIT is doing in Treasury where we have, you know, a, one of their responsibilities is to make sure that, you know, as HUD is talking with the Administrative Resources Center, as Commerce is talking with DOT, as Coast Guard is talking with Interior, to, to help broker those relationships and to make sure that those, uh, at the end of the day, we're able to kind of forge a partnership between those two agencies to enter into a shared service arrangement. And uh, it's interesting to kind of see how those conversations go because uh, you'll see that over, over time, uh, areas of differences are kind of diminish. And if we look at the conversations that we saw between HUD and ARC, for example, Adam, how many gaps did we see at the outset? Hundreds of mm. gaps that we saw between what HUD was asking for and what ARC was able to provide, and by the end of the conversation, where did that end up? Fewer than 50. And they recently signed an IAA to make this happen. So again, part of it is you know, making sure that the conversations are happening and kind of brokering, being able to look beyond positions to actually see interests and what is, what is the agency truly interested in happening, at, you know, seeing happen at the end of the day. In financial management, it's not that complex. You know, we're keeping the books, we're paying the bills, and even though we'd like to think that it's unique from agency to agency, it's not. So I think it really is nurturing those relationships and making sure that those conversations happen. And, it, and you'll see an evolution over time. And hopefully we'll see more agencies kind of end up in the right spot like we did with, with HUD and ARC. Can I ask well, a question? Sure. Um, how, Adam and, and Norm, how, how, did, how did you narrow that, that gap of, of uh, the, that, that gap um, from hundreds to, to 50? Was it just a matter of communication? the way we were describing requirements. What was, how did you get there? Can you get me a chair? <laughs> you want a chair, you want to come up? Okay. Um, um, so the, there's a process that the agencies go through with the federal providers that we're calling discovery, uh -huh. which is a series of discussions that go on for about three to four months where they sit down and talk in detail about the business processes uh -huh. that they're working through to identify the gaps. And I looked at them and I was actually quite surprised at the level of detail that these gaps actually go into. So they're really not talking about gaps at a, a very high level. They get down to some of the granularity. Um, and they can address through either, um, this is how I do it, this is how you do it, but we both get the same outcome. Okay, the gap is gone because we both get to the same outcome, we just do it differently. To, in certain instances, there was a piece of data that had to be captured through statute um, that they had to find a fix for. Um, but again, it's that tabletop discussion. Uh, a lot of times what I say is in the commercial environment when we would do that, we don't get to those discussions after we spent 13, 14, 15 months in an acquisition process. And so we really need to keep more of those discussions happening regardless of who your provider is. So I'm hearing communities of interest, I'm hearing collaboration fomenting, I yeah. see that in professional societies. Uh, question? Picking up on what Norman said about having the infrastructure within an agency established, um, when I, why are you pointing over there? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> my, my microphone didn't drop this time. Um, but uh, there was an example that I came across with NASA, NASA Soup, um, where they have these high-end products. And what's neat about that particular program is that they have a it's com combination of a GWAC with a working capital fund. So uh, one of the topics today I understand was payment transfers across the mm -hmm. uh, interagency. And the GWAC provides the vehicle for interagency payment transfers. And 
the working capital fund drills down to get the, the lowest prices because they're drawing through uh, payments within NASA and, and, and requisitions for products and they process it electronically. Anyway, my point is, and as we think about the uh, different ways to transact across federal agencies, that you have, of course, the franchise funds, which are allowed to do that. And occasionally you have this example of a NASA soup, which is a, a GWAC connected to a working capital fund. And I'm sure that you know other examples, but that's just one that I came across that I thought was a, a best practice. And I would reinforce and connect back to OMB. I was a beneficiary personally as a CIO in one of the agencies of the NASA soup capability, but that took a couple of things. It took the willingness of NASA to think about beyond just servicing myself, enabling having the ceiling in the contract, which goes back to some of the policy issues, to not just self-provision and look out for the greater good and have a policy framework that enabled them to do that. Right, but you gotta write that into to the statement of work before you put it on the street, right? So you have to have a lot of planning that goes into it ahead of time. So just a couple things, just uh, pulling on a couple of other points. Um, so communication, absolutely key. What we found a couple of years ago was agencies would start down the path of a fairly complex high-risk acquisition just to find out that, gosh, that's really 90% duplicative of NASA soup or NITEC or whatever it might be. And so we put in place the, the business case review process. And so OFPP issued that guidance and said, at a certain threshold, and it was sliding over a couple of years, you have to come and tell us what you're thinking about doing, not, not because we want to tell you yay or nay, but because we want to socialize it with our, our colleagues on these councils, um, the SSAOs, the Strategic Sourcing Accountable Officials that just got stood up in December with the SSLC. Send it out to everybody and ask a couple of really core, just basic questions. Do you, is this already being done someplace else? Who can we talk to? Have you done it well? Is it, you know, what, what should we learn about it? And so you know, the first couple of business cases really, you know, really locked down and said, you know, just, just let us go forth and do it and don't ask any questions. But as we started to have those dialogues, Agency started to say, well, we're not really sure about this part of it. Is there somebody you can point to at another agency that's done it well? And we made those connections. We had the, some defense service come in with a requirement for something, and we sent it out to all the NASA soups and all the GWAC providers and all the other agencies, and they found out that, gosh, OPM or GSA or somebody else was already doing it. And they said, we just didn't know. Mm -hmm. We didn't know who to talk to. We, we, we just we didn't know. And so we've elevated sort of the, the informal communication that has to happen to a little bit more formal, and we may take it even a step further. But it's been, it's been very helpful. We haven't, we haven't solved it, but it's, it's certainly a step in the right direction. So in that collaboration space, we saw a little demo at lunchtime here about Uncle Sam's uh, catalog, and we heard about some of the work of the Shared Service Subcommittee on the CIO Council. We also don't have them in the room, but Max was out in the hallway, and I know from historic that it formed in support of the budget formulation line of business, and then community after community joined mm -hmm. the collaboration mm -hmm. space enabled by Max. I'm kind of curious how you see the, uh, the community of interest enablement, and particularly with technology. Well, I'd, pro I'd probably say, um, uh, I'd ask, I, I see Phil back there that, that oversees kind of the, the Max uh, operations, so I'd probably spend some time. Where is your hand there, Phil? Uh, so, so if you, you really kind of want to know how that how he makes it work, it, it, that's a person to talk to there. But um, and then also Joe uh, was one of the the individuals who really had kind of the vision. And and is John here? John Larson? He left already. So um, so between Joe and, and John through that council through bringing the, the community together, uh, you know, put together the the Uncle Sam's list. So a, a single place uh, where an agency can go and see what kind of service is out there, what kind of contract is out there. Uh, and to, to and really we're starting to try to build that into the DNA of agencies to look at Uncle Sam's list first before you go out and procure something that, that maybe there's already a great strategic sourcing uh, effort underway for that. Or maybe there's a shared service, either internal or external, that can provide that uh, before you go build from scratch or buy from scratch. So, um, so I'd probably highlight uh, those two things. I don't know, Phil, do you have anything to say about how you've built your community of interest and gotten the word out about what you're doing with Max? Yeah, a couple things. Um, the, so why is OMB, a policy shop, providing shared services across government? I mean, one is because we really care about saving money and making the government more effective. Um, but a couple of just things that we stumbled into by magic. Um, one was 
uh, a policy decision about five years ago that everything we do will be outward facing first and then use permissions to restrict it so we can provide services to the rest of the budget community and, and oh, by the way, the whole rest of the government because if it's beneficial to somebody, why can't they use it? Um, the other thing we did, and the GSA folks really helped us with this, was to write our procurement vehicle from the beginning to be applicable to the entire federal government. That is, any agency that is a member of the budget line of business or using the MAX tools can use the procurement vehicle and that way uh, we didn't run into problems down the road of, oh, wait a minute, we can't use this because our agency isn't included. So just a couple little tiny decisions up front that made it really easy for us to then uh, provide services to the rest of the government. Yeah, good example. So uh, another example I can think of is uh, GSA in response to OMB's mandate for the trusted internet connection. There's all these agencies are trying to figure out how am I going to meet this, reduce all my internet connections down to meet this mandate. And GSA working with OMB and then working with Homeland Security came up with the requirements and created a new service under the networks vehicle called MTIPS. And as a result of that, all the agencies were able to easily order it because it's already on an acquisition vehicle. It's already done all the consolidation. The vendors did all the capital outlay to create the um, secure environment to put the Einstein boxes in it, et cetera. So as a result, agencies then also saved 50% over going out on their own trying to meet your mandate. So I thought that was a great example that where GSA stepped up and, and made it happen. Great. Thanks for sharing that. Okay, so I'm going to uh, want to get into the audience. Uh, we had another one down here. Uh, give people a heads up to start thinking about questions you'd like to ask. Go ahead, Dan. No, go ahead. Thank you. So this is terrific. Um, Thank you. I'll, I'll stand up. Um, following up on a comment, Norm, that you made about you have to have the recourse to do something if there's underperformance. And similarly, you want to have incentives for overperformance. And then looking, Leslie, there's a rich history that your office oversees in terms of SLAs and, how, and best practices there in working with companies in terms of government doing sort of both ends of it, you know, the, the stick and the carrot. Are, is there a discussion yet or or, sh or should there be discussion across the communities to think about what can we learn from that history to make the acquisition of shared services a success in terms of the incentives, both positive and negative? Uh, so I, I can start that. So I, I think in, in, when you think about contract management, that's probably the most difficult part of the process. We spend a lot of time on the award and the negotiation, but where the real rubber meets the road is how do you administer it? How do you determine whether the contractor, in this case, is doing a good job? And so the QASP, the Quality Assurance Surveillance Plan, right? We have lots of different samples up there. We sometimes still don't quite get it right. What should we be rewarding the contractor for doing or not doing? What is the disincentive and what is the incentive for award fee contracting? And so we, we still struggle with that. We've got lots of, of vetted quality assurance surveillance plans. We've got lots of um, information about performance metrics, but I think we have to apply it in this situation to you know the shared service providers, the agencies, and the contractors that support them. So I think there's still more work to be done, but we can look to the contract environment to help us. So on the question of recourse, there's a couple things that we've been considering. One is portability. So if I go to federal shared service provider A and they're not performing, then do I have the ability to pick up and move to federal shared service provider B? We recognize that there are switching costs and that you can't just go you know, pivot quickly and move to another provider. So then that kind of gets to the question of governance. And if you see a provider not performing, you know, what type of structure have we set up to be able to kind of elevate that issue and to really lean into the, the operation if you feel that, you know, the performance needs to improve. So again, we're still working through those details, but we want to make sure that at the end of the day, if we are asking agencies to move to federal shared service providers, we've set up some type of safety net and we've set up some ability to really, you know, demand and uh, high performance and to make sure that the providers meet that level of performance. So we've talked a fair amount about what's the provider obligation to perform. There were some earlier conversations. What do you think the customer's responsibility is in these partnerships? I'll start off. I, I think um, with any of these, and I, I think a couple of the, the, the three examples that, that we talked about, I'd love for you know, Scott or, or Sherry or anyone to, to step in on it as, or, or comment on this as well. But 
um, I, I think for agencies to get, be good partners, um, you know, kind of senior leaders within the agency need to also be committed to the shared service and, you know, make it, make it kind of a priority within the organization at whatever organization's using that shared service that this is the way we're gonna do business and let's, let's work with the shared service provider to make this a success and be committed to that success and be, uh, and communicate that they're committed to that success. So, so having kind of that, that senior leadership support, uh, participation in the process, whether it's formally as part of the governance structure or informally at least supporting uh, via communications um, that, that they're in support of the shared service, I, I think is, is, is really key. So I don't know, Scott, did you see that with, uh, with, the, tre with the, the Treasury example or with the GX GSA example? So I'd love to, love to hear on that as well. But, but I think Scott actually said it. We, we decided we weren't going to customize. Right. We were just going to reduce our process down to its core elements and standardize on that and stop saying we're, we're unique. We have unique processes. Right. We couldn't possibly join forces here, um, you know, but we'll certainly think about it in the next go around. I think, as you, as Lisa said, tone at the top just reduces yeah. those, those core elements to the things that you can share. And I think you, you do have to make that, that leap. And it, it's uncomfortable when people don't like to do it. But once you get there, it's, it's a better place. But it's that support, too, like is to kind of amplify what you're saying, uh, that, that yeah, we'll, we'll look at our business processes yeah. and maybe be willing to, to change our business processes to, to make this work, still get to the outcome we want to get to, but, but maybe change the way we actually have been doing business to get to that, that outcome that's already being experienced or that will be achieved through that shared service. So. Only thing I would add is to say that there's still, even if you are going to a shared service provider, there's still a significant commitment of resources on the agency's part in terms of time and subject matter expertise that you have to devote. Particularly, uh, Adam mentioned before the discovery process, and I remember you know when we were looking at going to ARC uh, when I was back in DHS, uh, we had to we had to do some thoughtful planning in terms of the subject matter experts that we would make available to work with ARC during this discovery process because it was you know, many months of effort and we had to figure out, all right, we've got to get our experts working with them and then we're going to have to backfill them in the operation. So I think it takes some thoughtful planning in terms of how you're going to continue doing your day to day, but at the same time, how are you going to you know, bring the, the knowledge of your operation uh, to work with the shared service provider to not work through not just discovery, but also the other phases of implementation as well. So we had a little bit of the uh, kind of looping back to the public-private engagement in particular with the service provider kind of conversation. And it's, it's analogous with whether it's a public provider or a private sector provider, but some of these uh, perceptions in engaging with the private sector, things like the federal acquisition regulations, things like the Federal Advisory Committee Act, that per, at least people perceive him for their ability to do the kind of very eyeball to eyeball, personal, clear exchanges that get the expectations and the capabilities matched up. I'm just curious, I know the Mythbusters campaign was focused on that, I'm sorry I didn't stand <laughs> but if that's, if you think that's being successful, if there's more things like that that are needed, because you can't really have those kinds of dialogues with people that think they're going to do that at arm's length, I'll send you 5,000 pages of requirements, and I'll see what you write me back. Right. So, so uh, Mythbusters, thank you for bringing that up. Um, so a couple of years ago, we, we found that, that there was sort of a chilling effect between government and industry, and so we wanted to to give contracting officers, their legal counsels, and their program managers a little bit of top cover with the MythBusters memo. So just like with anything we issue, it's it's probably effective for the first you know year or whatnot, and then we need to do a little bit more outreach and engagement. So I, I think Joe has heard that, and I think we're thinking about doing something that amps it up a little bit. Um, but what was interesting about those two memoranda is that we didn't do anything new. There was no new policy. We didn't write a new reg. This was just repackaging what was already available in the FAR. And believe it or not, even though the FAR is very thick and complicated, there's a lot of flexibility in there. You just have to figure out where it is. So, so we, we continue to go back to MythBusters. In, in the strategic sourcing um, environment, we, you've got to have industry engagement before you can even bring an idea to the commodity team. Those are the kinds of things we're trying to bake into the process. Uh, same with, you know, with the business case um, process as well. 
we have to know that the agencies thought about that industry engagement before they brought the case to us. And so trying to interject, especially for the high risk, high volume, you know, high visibility kinds of transactions, we still go back to the, the most important bit of information we can get is, is, is from industry. What does the market look like? Is the acquisition strategy fair? How did the agency do at the end of the acquisition? There's something to think about. How did they actually do just on the transaction piece? Um, mm -hmm. So that's maybe something more for another Mythbusters memo. So do we have more questions for our speakers? Don, oh, never mind. Oh, no. One there, one there. Good afternoon. I'm Elsie uh, Williams from the HR line of business. I do applaud OMB and uh, OPM colleagues for the e-payroll and the HR LOB model because it's one of the more successful ones out there, saving $1.6 by uh, by 15. And I think with that mature model, one of the things that we've actually realized, you talk about recourse for clients that if the provider is not performing, but one of the, the real issues is the funding models that we actually have, working capital fund, no opportunity for uh, capital investments to replus, uh, re replenish and upgrade systems, huge, uh, huge problem. You do have the parent problem that you kind of talked about, so there's no guidelines for the parents to, to be a real parent for the providers. <laughs> so, I mean, when you look at those kind of things, those are the issues that actually bring about a lot of problems. I think as we try to expand the uh, shared services across a lot of other business areas, those really need to be addressed. How do we have a better funding model? How do we have guidelines for the parent agencies that are actually have providers? And then how do we have a model to enhance the success of the provider? Because again, there's encouragement to come to the providers for shared services, but really there's nothing out there that actually helps us be more successful in, in having better systems, having better solutions. Right now, we are very diplomatic in going to our client agencies to help get funding for new products and new services to have the things that you want them to come to us for. So it's actually been kind of the, the leadership, the creativity, the... Uh, entrepreneurship of OPM and the providers to make these things happen. And I think as we look forward to the future, we kind of need to address those issues as others get into that, to that business of having better models for having good quality systems and services and making sure we got a model for success. Let me start uh, on that. I think you raised some really good points. So when we look at the funding model, we're seeing uh, examples of franchise funds across the landscape. We're also seeing examples of working capital funds across the landscape. And you mentioned that with working capital fund structure, uh, our hands are a little bit more tied. And my question is, what's preventing us from proposing a different structure? So if we look at the annual budget process, you know, if something is structured as a working capital fund, what's preventing the agency from being able to, in its you know, budget submission to say, we really think that we should be a franchise fund? instead. So as part of this and the work we're, we're doing with Treasury, for example, we've asked them to kind of identify what are the constraints right now, what are some of the limitations that uh, are preventing us from, you know, scaling up on this concept, uh, and then why are we not proposing change? So if something is structured as a working capital fund, what prevents us from saying, hey, can this be an enterprise fund instead? Exactly, but what's preventing us from putting it in the president's budget and saying this is what we propose, and that, that starts the conversation. So, it, you know, it really is, if you look at the formulation cycle, the agency should be taking the lead in terms of making the proposal to OMB and we have the conversation around that and then it kind of continues through the process. But we have flexibility in terms of what we propose. How Congress disposes of it is a different question, but we, we at least have flexibility to propose. Yeah, I think we had another question. Uh, go ahead, Jason. Hey, uh, Jason Miller, Federal News Radio. You know I can't resist. Uh, what's interesting about today, that I know you guys are just here at the very end, is these conversations we've had all day feels a little deja vu-like, and here's why. I was a young pup covering this stuff back in the early <laughs> 2000s. All right, I wasn't really that young, but. And I feel like the same conversations continue to happen. Change management, leadership from the top, and. I don't want discounting, those are important things. So it's actually very refreshing in some ways to hear you guys talk about, especially Norm. They understand some of the maybe challenges of the past and you're trying to address them. But one thing that has not come up at all today 
And I think OMB has to address, it's not an agency thing, is the Economy Act. You cannot do any of this until you solve the Economy Act. And I've written stories about it, I've talked to people in this audience, and they're all looking at me funny now, I'm sure, because why does he have to keep coming back to that? Agencies cannot deal with it until you solve it. And I don't hear anybody talking about the, sol the solution, and yes, Congress is part of the problem or solution, but what's going on with the Economy Act? Uh, is there even any legislative proposals? I think we, since we Norm was singled here. out <laughs> as having answered these things very well, that you should tackle that question You might first. characterize what the yeah, current exactly. context is for everybody. The Economy Act transfers and what's involved. Leslie? I actually think we have to know <laughs> first with Norm on that one. As we've had conversations on how to scale up and the challenges uh, that we face, uh, this has not come up as a central issue. So I'm, I want to make sure that we're following some of the limitations and constraints that you are suggesting through the Economy Act. So, so my understanding, and I am by no means the expert on this, so if I have it wrong, forgive me, is that someone like, and, and I think Joe Ward was here earlier, he may have left, so forgive me, Joe, if I bring you into this and this doesn't apply to you, they cannot invest money, they, can, they cannot take a profit, and I know profit's a dirty word in government, but they cannot put aside money to do investment on IT for the next generation technology. They have to live almost paycheck to paycheck, for lack of a better word. Dan, do I have this right? But I, I, think that comes back to what <laughs> I think that comes back to what we were talking about before, whether you're a working capital fund or whether you're a franchise fund, because my understanding with a franchise fund is that you can have you know, a rainy, you know, a, an or, investment or pool that you create. I think it's up to 4%. Somebody keep me honest on this question. <laughs> so it really, you do have some flexibility out there. I don't think you have any deal breakers out there. And I, our sense is that franchise funds are probably more appropriate for the model that we're talking about as opposed to working capital funds where your hands truly are tied. Yeah. Good answer. Go ahead. The last question. Hi, I'm Rob Hill from EPA, and uh, I worked about a year and a half with OMB uh, back in the day. And uh, my question was, I, I found the point about portability from provider to provider to be a rather compelling point. Does that not make uh, a case for standardized data architectures within the lines of business and within the initiatives that are that under which the uh, shared services are being supported? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I should Very have asked point, a better yes. question. <laughs> Okay, um, on that punctual and uh, clear answer. Uh, if you would join me, please, I'd like to uh, thank the OMB uh, panelists for coming over and sharing their thoughts with us today.